Hey, good morning, fellas, and welcome to the Project Rebalance blog. So this is a uh, blog that just came out. This is December 7th now, and the title is Project Rebalance Overview Scythe and Fang. So we are finally getting some big news on what they plan to do with Scythe and Fang, and not just some speculation on the idea of what they're trying to do. So this doesn't just cover Scythe and Fang. It covers a huge amount of topics, ranging from skilling to PVM to PVP. Um, and it's going to be looking at various items and skills and progression throughout all of these things. Now, this blog is actually insanely huge, and I want to cover a lot of it, but it's just going to take half an hour. So I'm going to link it in. I'm going to link it in the description. It'll be pinned in the comments and stuff. Um, or you can just go to the website and read it if you're really interested. But what I'm going to do is skip to the really important parts and do a little intro to explain what this is all about in the first place. So this whole thing is a game jam project. And the idea of a game jam project is that uh, mods are allowed to sort of choose their own topics they're interested in and evolve them a bit and have a look at things they care about and bring some ideas to the table, fresh ideas that, that you know, on, on the topic they're interested in. And if it's interesting enough, they can deliver it to the community and get some ideas. And if we like it, and which in this case we did, um, they'll bring it and make it a bit more of a serious thing down the road. So game jam is like an ideation week and, and some good stuff comes out of it. This is one of them. So um, this is Arcane, Halo, Husky, and Kieran that have been doing this. And this is, a, again, this is a huge thing. So uh, I'm going to run straight into it. This, I've already done one take and it was like 30 minutes. Not doing that again. Um, there is Agility Slayer and Thieving Miscellaneous Skilling Tweaks. And that's this section here. The main things to look at is that they're rebalancing XP rates and requirements. Um, they're making stuff less annoying. And things like this, for example, and the very top part, um, they're, they're basically making it so that a lot of the skill doesn't really get increased XP rates or lowered XP rates, but the jumps between different courses, the jumps between different NPCs, the progression between them in terms of the XP an hour gain or level gain is going to be a bit more linear, hopefully. Um, it's going to be a little bit sort of nicer to train and you get this feeling of progression. That's the idea they're going for. And the other thing is that they want to make uh, certain methods more competitive and bring them back into the meta a little bit uh, without devaluing other things. So for example, Brimhaven is going to be a bit more competitive high effort, a bit like how Sepulchre is high effort and better XP, whereas your st standard rooftop is a bit sort of chill and very repetitive and cyclical. You can just kind of get into a rhythm for it. Um, so it's going to, well, I mean, they need a whole blog to dedicate to some of this stuff like Brimhaven, but it's interesting to see the idea. Um, they also have ideas such as Improving Gloves of Silence, Ring of Pursuit, Necklace of Faith, and Aferity's Aid. And items like this are actually very ignored for the most part. They just don't have a use. I think Gloves of Silence are like semi-useful. Um, Aferity's Aid, when buffed, uh, might be useful for PVM. It's basically a necklace. It's a topaz necklace that regenerates prayer when your HP gets low, which is kind of interesting. Um, but that's the idea anyway. So these items could come into play, but right now they're just not used, really. They have other things like streamlining, streamlining creation of Gothic's rests, uh, make all functionality to bar parts, improving Dorgish kind light abilities, and really interesting here is the changes to hopefully Turiel. Um, basically, Turiel is overly used by a lot of high level players, and low level players suffer a lot from the task list as well as the frequency of not the frequency, the amount of NPCs that are given. For example, you can get fifteen ice fiends or you can get 50 wolves as your max tasks. And wolves are like, if you go to White Wolf Mountain as, a, as your go-to place as a new player, it's multi-combat, you're gonna get screwed. And so it's just a little bit awkward. Um, but rebalancing that is great for new players and experienced players alike. Much needed, and hope they go into more depth on, the, on this in particular. Uh, moving on to mining, I'm gonna skip all this text. Basically what they're doing here, uh, I don't wanna linger too long on mining, it is interesting, again, you can read it if you want is the idea that they want to approach different methods of viability and approachability. Volcanic Mine being uh, requiring too many prerequisites and kudos and a team and experience and knowledge to get into it. Maybe making it soloable would make more sense. I mean, it is soloable, but more soloable or reducing the requirements. Glass Mine is like a bot activity right now, so just some viability increase makes sense. Adjusting things like mining gloves again, they're looking at different items that are getting forgotten to time. And they shouldn't lower the price, but they should increase the effect or the XP rate that you get from doing stuff using them. That makes a lot of sense as well. 
Some other things like adding more viable start spots to reduce competition for granite and sandstone, completely fine. And adjusting some Zalcano stuff as well to make it so that players can choose between high GP or high XP an hour. Um, interesting to see how they're going to do it. Again, probably needs a blog. Nice to know they haven't actually mentioned stars in here. They haven't mentioned stars at all, so they probably think shooting stars is in a decent place. Um, but they now want to they now want to improve the rest of the skill, not just like one aspect. So that's cool. And now onto the heavier stuff. So run energy changes have its little section up here, and it's not really uh, a detail on what they're doing. But the TLDR of run energy is that when you are running in game. Whether I am 1 agility or 99 agility, my run is going to hit 0 at the same time. And only when you are walking or stationary does your run regenerate. And so that's already a bit of a weird one, and that's just how it's always been. But it would make a lot of sense to change it so that at 99 agility, you can run, maybe not indefinitely, but for the majority of your time. Uh, making the actual regeneration apply while running at the very least would be a start. Um, there's some more stuff to it, and they got to be careful not to like completely kill stems and things like that, but no big deal, and it's good to see they're getting this change. If there's one thing we can probably all agree on, it's that low-level gameplay suffers massively from lack of running, or ability to run, or just stems if you're an iron. So, moving on to NPC defense changes, this is where we get into the combat stuff. Um, this one's pretty interesting. So they want to, essentially at the top here, make it so that you have, um, if you're using the correct style, like Gargoyle is weak to crush, and you use something like a cudgel, you're going to be doing better than if you were using a whip. And this is fine, I think there's nothing wrong with it. I introducing the idea of like effective style and making sure players do use a good style for things is nice. Um, and they don't, want to, they don't want to make it so crush like destroy stuff, but it's just much more effective to use an effective weapon. Just make it make sense really, which is fine. How they're going to do this, whether they increase the stats or increase like how much a style defense matters, we don't quite know yet. So that's going to have to wait to see. Um, there is a huge amount of text here, I'm just not going to go through it, it's just too much. Um, but what they do mention, this is important, is that they're not changing this combat system. This is not evolving combat. So they, they want to just keep the same everything and make it feel a bit smoother or make it make a bit more sense, which is, I believe, completely fine. Uh, and again, yeah, separate blog, it needs it, and they're going to go through it at some point, probably next year at this stage, and that's completely fine. Combat item adjustments. This is where we get to the really, really cool stuff, and um, they're going to be having a look at certain items they want to nerf, and that is the top section here. So first on the list is Osmonton's Fang. Thank God it's finally here. We've been talking about it for a year. And the TLDR is it's too strong on non-stab styles. It's primarily a stab weapon, but mostly it deletes everything else in Slash. And that is because it has a double accuracy roll or an effective double accuracy roll and instead of applying only to stab, it applies also to slash and also, well, I think well, those are the two styles. So basically it just ruins the slash uh, space for weaponry. Void Waker guaranteed hits. They think that it is a bit difficult to design worthwhile spec DPS weapons in the future without creeping upwards significantly. And because Void Waker is like a guaranteed hit instead of like a 99 or a 90%, um, Anything that has a significant amount of defense, Void Waker is your go-to weapon. And so it's devalued a whole lot of other stuff from actually being quite useful. And if they change it to like 80% accuracy, maybe, like that would probably make a lot more sense. And um, I don't know, I, I, this needs a whole blog on its own. I haven't run the numbers on these things. I don't really know. This is all just like speculation and whatnot. I should mention. Uh, Ancient Godsword, interesting one, but they're saying that it sort of elongates Outlast fights, it makes it a bit long and a bit boring maybe, and um, yeah, I don't know, I guess it's just a bit unfair or a bit silly. It makes more sense to me that if this is a PvP problem, that you would want to try and play for that big spec weapon KO as opposed to an Outlast. It's just a bit more interesting in the first place. But hey, gotta wait to see on that one. Occult Necklace, this is a huge one as well, and the idea is it's too much power in a single item. Um, they want to bring down its power and distribute its magic damage to other parts of magic progression. What I think they should do here is, Occult stands at 10% magic damage increase. I think they should make it an 8% damage increase total and redistribute the 8. I think of the 8, 3 should go to Occult, 2 should go to Arcane Prayer Scroll, and 1 should go to Ancestral, 1 for each piece. That's how I think they should do it. That would make Occult a 3, damage, three magic percent damage. 
Um, Arcane gets two, which obviously is a buff, but we expected this for many, many years now. Uh, yes, Arcane will rise if that's the case, but hey, that's fine, that's fine. Like, make chambers more value, that's great. Make it actually useful to use the prayer, that's fine. And then whether you put 1% on each of the ancestral pieces or somewhere else, I don't really know. But, um, I mean, you can choose wherever you want, really. Ancestral seem to make sense, 1% per piece. And then we have Tome of Water and Fire. These need to be kept in mind alongside potential for elemental weaknesses. If elemental weaknesses pick up some of the slack for elemental damages, these tomes likely become too strong and need adjusting accordingly. So just keeping in mind, they're not really going to do anything crazy here, but it's good to know they're not forgetting stuff. They've really looked at like all aspects in this case. Right, next up we have what they're going to be bringing up in power and why. First up is adjusting the damage. This is huge, by the way. Adjusting damage on hit to roll from 1 to your max instead of 0 to your max. This is actually quite integral to combat overall. Um, and it does matter a huge amount for things like Dragon Warhammer and also things like Keris. So at TOA, I mean, I'll, I'll, get, into that, I'll get into that example, but like for, for a Dragon Warhammer, for its effect, basically you can roll... If, if, if your max hit is 10, it's not, but if your max hit is 10 and you roll, you get a 0 to your 10. And if you roll a zero, even though you passed accuracy, the Warhammer doesn't actually apply. And so it's a bit silly because you passed accuracy, but you just didn't hit a number. And giving you that hit guaranteed means that if you do actually pass your accuracy, you'll always get the defense reduction. It's also the case for things like Keras in TOA, where if you're doing team raids and you Keras something, you would expect that that is going to give you... Um, like the Keras effect, but you don't really know, so you can't call it because you didn't see the hit, you didn't see the XP. Um, and even the plugin doesn't work with it. So there are things for a lot of spec weapons, and they do also mention that for early combat, you just won't hit a lot of zeros if you pass accuracy because if your max hit is a two, you've got a one in three chance of just rolling a zero even if you passed accuracy. And that just feels bad. So I like the idea of this. Um, I wonder what repercussions it will have, but that just needs some discussion. Um, Otherwise, I think it's okay. Additional considerations for 10 HP guys, and then they'll get into that, so that's okay. Scythe of Vitter. Um, this is pretty huge, and of course, we were expecting Scythe buffs and Scythe news. So it does say not enough existing use cases, often too expensive, more on this later. And of course, with the Fang out of competition, now that it's getting a bit of a nerf, hopefully, uh, Scythe will begin to flare up a bit and be a bit more useful. Eldermall is also on the list, not enough existing use cases, doesn't befit its mega rare status. So again, they're thinking of things to do. I don't believe the idea of Eldermall being good at Tecton past. I don't think those changes are happening, but it does seem they want some way to make it relevant. Personally, my favorite idea is to add it as an attachment to the Warhammer. People have been asking for a Warhammer buff for ages, and although the above thing is giving it one, why not have an Elder Warhammer? Why not make it an attachable item to the Warhammer to benefit it, to give it like a guaranteed hit on various NPCs? Something like that, just an example. Um, I like the idea, I think it could look really cool and play into its effect, and it's all crush-based, and it's all like, you know, Warhammer, mall-based, it sounds cool. Inquiz is on the list as well, very rare. Uh, Mace often falls short of other offerings, even in places where crush should be the go-to. And so they're thinking, yes, you know, you know, it, need, it needs a bit of help here to make it worthwhile. Maybe just increase the accuracy or you know, just do something to make it so the bonus of the set is effective. Again, you could do something like when wearing Inquisitors and using a crush spec weapon, the first attack always lands. So with Warhammer or an Elder Warhammer, you could have some super bonus. I don't know, just a cool idea. Sol Reaper X, a bit too frustrating to feel using, uh, a bit too frustrating to feel good using. I used to feel like this, but I actually quite like the item. But I can understand that outside of a higher level, it is frustrating to use. So, sure. Reduce drain rate of bottom tier prayers like thick skin, burst of strength. Um, I think that's fine. I mean, they don't get used for very long, but being able to use it for a, a decent, if not indefinite time when low level prayer or low level slayer um, would be nice. And then it says improve sharp eye and burst of strength. And the problem is that they don't actually do anything until you can hit 20s, which is quite high already. So they need to make it sort of like give you a max hit or a bit of accuracy at least. Um, but yeah, it doesn't quite line up with the level they're unlocked at. So a really nice list of stuff, and they're not just looking at big tier stuff, but also lower tier stuff, which is good. And now onto the huge stuff. They're going to be going into detail on Scythe and Osmonton's Fang, the thing we've all been waiting for. So, 
Osmonton's fame. Old School's premier tank-busting stab weapon was introduced alongside a most recent raid, yada yada yada. And uh, essentially, a stab weapon for no additional upkeep costs uh, it sits a bit too close to dedicated slash weapons. And this is because that it was essentially using its doubled accuracy roll. Oh, it still is, I guess, until they change it. It's going to use its doubled accuracy roll on slash as a stab weapon. And so the idea of this is to remove the doubled accuracy roll passive and apply it only to stab. Yes, this is what I've been asking for for many, many, many months now. This was the cleanest and easiest and best solution, I believe. So it's great to hear that they've not just been ignoring it and it's really going to happen. Huge, huge, huge for just everyone and everything. But everyone's saying that, oh, they're nerfing my fang that I got myself and like it's hurting my progression. You got to stop thinking so sort of selfishly, I guess. You got to think about the wider game and how that if you own a fang, you just never need any other weapon. It makes the game very boring. Um, and so there's a lot more to it than that. But fundamentally, don't don't think too selfishly. Um, think more about the whole idea of progression for the melee weapons and think that one item fits all really isn't a healthy way to play the game. Sorry your weapon's getting nerfed, unlucky mate. And this means that Fang remains a good generalist and still re re retains its power in the stab niche and that's completely fine. Um, still really useful in all these places, right? But it just like becomes not good at Vardorvis compared to Scythe or compared to Axe or compared to anything. Um, it doesn't become useful at, for example, Duke anymore. Uh, it probably isn't good at P2 Verzik anymore. It retains, it gives Scythe a bit more power back in those positions it really should have always have had that power in. And now onto the biggest part of the blog, the Scythe of Vitter. We want to buy the Scythe! Hooray! Let's chat about it and why. Good. The why is simple, comes up in a lot of conversations with the team and community. It is a mega rare and it's one of the three big endgame items alongside Tebow and Shadow. It's also old school's hardest raid, and they like mention it here. Like it is, you know, Tom is difficult. Um, so offering really expensive and powerful, powerful weaponry from the hard content makes sense. It doesn't feel like it occupies the same space as Tebow or Shadow, and it doesn't because these places, uh, these weapons have more places they're useful. Uh, Scythe just has a lack of use cases, and it mentions here they really just don't have that many. It's not that it has none, it's just not as powerful or doesn't, you know, doesn't quite hit that bis mark. Um, but yeah, its usage cost is one of the highest, and it is, but um, I don't think that's ever been a problem for someone who really owns it, but I can see it being a bit much. Even at some places where Scythe is technically best in slot, it's often not good enough compared to the second or third best options to feel worth for the use of cost. This used to be a problem in a few places. Um, I'm trying to think of one in particular. Oh yeah, uh, Nightmare and Fasani. Back on release of Nightmare, um, Nightmare rates were very bad, but if you were scything Nightmare, you were actually losing GP per hour to get a drop. That was how bad it was. Like If you got a harmonized staff worth max cash, you might have made your money back. It was that bad on release. Um, and there are a few places where it just it, it just makes no sense to do it, either for the blood rune upkeep or for the actual GP cost. So sure, I can under, I can understand it. Like you know, now now that now that the idea is to make it so it retains some charges or it uses less, the viability goes up once more. Um, Vardovis and Duke encapsulate this. There you go. Um, let's see what else there is. How is a little less simple needs us to look at both short and long term. Long term, we want to commit to adding more content featuring low defense slash weak 3x3 or bigger bosses where Scythe is likely to shine. So they are just saying purely, like nice and simply, hey, T Bone Shadow have these use cases and all these bosses and they work globally. And then Scythe is very limited because you actually need a specific defense, specific slash weak, specific 3x3 boss. Um, and it's good they're going to do these things because bigger bosses are fun to fight. Um, but they need to actually design it for Scythe. And this statement here is like exclusively like, Jumping right into that and embracing that, and that's fantastic. That's good for the game in general, I think. You don't have to make Scythe like a 20 bill weapon, you just have to make it like strong and effective and fit its niche in the same way Scythe and Tebow do, uh, with the same amount of NPC use cases. So, I don't know, there's a lot of text here to read. I don't think too much matters. You can read it if you want. I'm going to get through to the idea of what they're trying to do. And so, here it is. With all of this idea in mind, we want to give Scythe a slight accuracy buff. So its use cases are slightly expanded, 
and performs a little better against NPCs with more respectable defense levels. Because defense was one of its problems and still is, like, classically. And so, add 15 slash accuracy to Scythe. For reference, um, there are not many things that give good slash accuracy in the first place. The notable one is Bellator for a plus 20 slash accuracy. So a 15 slash accuracy is similar to wearing a Bellator, which um, is very effective. Um, it, it's better than having a max hit at the likes of Satetseg and P2 Verzik, um, and probably a couple of other DT2 bosses while we're at it. But this is not to be overlooked. That's a, that's a hefty chunk of slash accuracy. They could have done probably a bit more, but probably not a bit less. If it was like 10 or 12, it'd feel a bit underwhelming, but 15 is probably, probably a conservative amount to begin with. And that's okay. Um, again, I don't really know the numbers here, but they do, they do give a couple saying that adding 15% slash accuracy increases scythe DPS at 0.2% at a low defense, but up to 7% at a boss like Grador. And Grado can be compared to maybe like P2 Verzik, and so you're getting nearly a 10% increase to damage at P2 Verzik, which is huge. Um, but you know, Scythe, you know, it's already so accurate anyway at low, de low defense stuff, it doesn't matter. But this is about improving its scope and its range for a couple of higher defense places. Good stuff. Um, alongside the Fang nerf, I think it's really going to bring it into light. Uh, is Scythe going to blast off to a billion GP? Maybe not instantaneously. But if they add a lot of NPCs and content building around it over time, honestly, yeah, I can see it. Um, which is really good. That's where it should be alongside Scythe and Tebow. And then we have reduced charge cost from 1 vial of blood on 300 to 1 and 200. Um, just a little increase. I mean, that's completely fine. We're saving like 200k per hour for use case. That's fine. I mean, again, I, I don't think it's too big a deal, but sure. And um, only use a charge when the Scythe actually hits an enemy. This is probably bigger and in combination helps a lot. So because you're missing all the time, but you're still using charges, that's a bit silly. Um, it'd be really nice to see if they change anything with Blood Fury to make it so that that's also dependent on actually hitting. But somehow, I don't know, maybe that is how it works, maybe not, I don't know. But I would have liked to have seen something here with Blood Fury. Maybe I just misremembered. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the whole idea. So expected but very, very welcome changes to both Fang and Scythe. Really nice stuff across the board for everything from skilling, PvM, PvP. Um, there's been a lot of work on their end to like compile this. And now I think that both Scythe and Fang have been uh, specified as to like what they want to do. It's likely we're going to see that... Well, it's likely we're going we're gonna to see those changes early next year, and then building into more of this stuff over the next few years. Um, or at least across one whole year. But, uh, I don't know, there's a huge amount, obviously. That's the entire blog, though. So if you've got any thoughts or interested in uh, any particular part of this that you'd fancy discussing, throw it down in the comments. I'll try and respond or anyone else can. But I don't know. Good stuff, really. Happy with it. Very nice to see. So looking forward to the next few blogs at the uh, start of next year.